Dr. Smith, Chancellor Head, and members of the board, it's uh, my pleasure to represent the presidents tonight uh, for our monthly board report. This does make presentation number seven in about four days. So, mm, yeah. uh, but on, it's perfect uh, segue on the heels of what you just heard Dr. Head explain. Uh, Lone Star College, Tombaugh, and all of the other colleges as well are very committed to changing the world and uh, making it a better place. And we recognize that too much has been given, there is a great responsibility to give back. And you can tell by the presentations from AACC, uh, the kind of giving back we're doing at a national level. We also give back all the time uh, throughout the year. And what I wanna share with you tonight are some ways that Lone Star College is trying to not only impact the success of our students, but the success of students all over the country by sharing uh, our information, our practices, and just what we do. So a few examples and highlights of how we do that. So Lone Star College Sci Fair uh, this last March held their second annual math symposium. As you can see, they brought together instructors, tutors, uh, different folks, over 100 people from these colleges to collaborate on best practices in math from Lone Star College, University of Houston, San Jacinto, San Jacinto Georgia Perimeter, and Cypher ISD. Here's some pictures from, from that event. You can tell it was very well attended and a very collaborative session on how best uh, to engage students in math. Lone Star College Kingwood uh, had its History Day conference, and the purposes there are also to bring together K-12 educators in the college for the purpose of professional development, to share resources, to examine history and the necessary instructional tools they can use to teach uh, their students in June 2018 with the Holocaust Museum. Before you go any further, is that Craig Livingston? It is. On the right? Okay. <laughs> Lone Star College Montgomery has earned quite a national reputation as being a leader in predictive analytics. Uh, they did an AACC conference uh, presentation on that. They've also made their expertise available to those of us throughout the college. And so last October, uh, Rebecca was telling me almost 200 people from throughout Lone Star College attended their data camp to learn how they are using predictive analytics to improve enrollment, persistence, retention, and graduation. When they have their next one in 2018, that will also be open to other colleges uh, as well, outside of Lone Star. North Harris offered a Partners in Education event, an Educational Partnership Expo last March. Again, they brought in counselors, teachers, principals, administrators from both public and private schools in their service area to talk about all of our services and pathways for students from transfer, financial aid, workforce education, and the Honors College as well. Lone Star College Tomball is about to offer its third annual GRIT Summit. We started this in 2015. Uh, we've had people from around the system <coughs> present their stories. We've talked a lot about stories tonight. Dr. Alden Smith was one of our presenters last year. Mario, several folks from throughout Lone Star have shared their own GRIT stories, how they overcame adversity. And our purpose with this summit is to highlight ways that we can develop the resilience, instinct, tenacity, and growth mindset in students around the country. Save the date for Friday, October 12th. I'm very excited about this year's keynote speaker. These two students, Ayrton and Alex Little, were recently featured on Ellen. They were raised by a single mother, Maureen Little, on the verge of homelessness. They actually live in the area and they both were accepted with full scholarships to Ivy League schools. And Maureen, the mom, is our keynote speaker in October. So we're very excited to have her share her story about how she instilled this kind of mindset in her sons. Lone Star College University Park had their second annual Texas Open Innovation Conference where they partnered, as you can see here, not with just educators, but with also employers in the area. You know, Noble Energy, uh, Oral Roberts University, Harris County, CEO Willowbrook Hospital, Methodist Hospital, 
all of those, even NASA ExxonMobil you can see here, to talk about how to innovate, how to partner uh, the, between education and the business community. There's some great pictures from that event, also very collaborative and well attended, uh, very much a, a way to give back, not just to our com community, but to our employers as well. But we're, the colleges aren't the only ones doing this. I wanted to just highlight a couple of the conferences that are offered by our system office. They are also very committed to sharing with other colleges around the country. For instance, the Globalization Higher Ed Conference that was just in April, Grant Summit is a, is a popular conference to help learn how to attain more grants, and the Faculty Symposium actually featured some of our faculty from around the system. The Lone Star College has a lot to give back. It's a pleasure and an honor to work for a place that takes, um, to recognize to whom much has been given, there is a great responsibility. And with that, I will answer any questions you might have. I yes, have sir. one question, just for curiosity, back on the Sci Fair slide. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, or it mentioned, House Bill 2223. <clears throat> And I was just wondering what that was. If not, I'll just look it up tonight. <laughs> Kim is the expert oh, okay. on it. She did her dissertation on it. Yeah, oh, Kim's about okay. to do it. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. And she'll say it much more eloquently than I will. Well, okay, appreciate it. All you right. guys Any are always other on the ball. Yeah. The, all the services that uh, were talked about at North Harris, that's available? Is it on the website somewhere where we can find that? I don't know. Yeah, I, I get a lot of questions from that. When we had a church and it's twelve dollars a piece. Okay. Okay. Good. good job. Thank you very much. Help. Get that to the end for you. Oh, okay. There you go. Helen, you're up next. More than 600 guests attended. Chair Smith, trustees, yeah. and Chancellor Head. Uh, as you know, Lone Star College is very lucky to have a very active and committed board of directors for the Lone Star College Foundation. And their mission is to raise money for scholarships and programs for the college. And their premier event each year is the Star Gala. It was held April 14th at the Waterway Marriott. Many of you were there. Uh, the, those of you who were there know that it was a terrific event. And I've asked uh, Nicole Robinson Gauthier, who's our executive director of the foundation, uh, to come up and give you a report on Star Gala 2018. Good evening. Well, I'll just let the video speak for itself because the majority of my report will be right here. More than 600 guests attended the Lone Star College Foundation Star Gala 2018 around the world in 80 days to celebrate and support student success. A highlight of the evening was when Lone Star College promised scholarship recipient Rachel Perez was presented with a scholarship to attend the University of Houston downtown to continue her studies. Many students start close at Lone Star College and finish UHD strong thanks to numerous programs that have been specifically aligned to transfer seamlessly between the two institutions. Perez, who is majoring in biology with the goal of becoming a pediatrician or an emergency room physician, expressed her gratitude, thanking the attendees for taking the time to help her reach her goal. Another important role the Lone Star College Foundation plays is helping fund the LSC Promise Scholarship. This scholarship is designed to reduce financial barriers to college and provide students with the means to fund the balance of tuition and mandatory fees. Star Gala 2018 also featured many sought-after silent and live auction items, including Golf with the Chancellor, which raised more than $27,000. Many lives were changed for the better during Star Gala 2018, thanks to the support of all of the generous LSC Foundation donors and sponsors. In all, more than $490,000 was raised. 
Your support truly helps students start close and go far. perfect little capsule, but definitely the highlight of our evening was University of Houston downtown surprising our SciFair graduate, who was a scholarship, promised scholarship recipient, um, with a full scholarship to continue her education. And we were wonderful that um, Jill Jackson Lee, our congresswoman, joined us for the, ev the event and uh, gave a speech and uh, honored us with her presence. So lots of great things happening at the foundation, and so thank you for your support. And just wanted to make sure that you had some information on what we're up to. Did you want me to give a little bit on the uh, flood report? And then sure. I put you on the spot, my apologies. But one of the things that uh, has come up recently is uh, we've given out a, a great deal of funding in Hurricane Harvey relief. And there was another round of funding that came through this spring that I wanted to make sure you were aware of. Um, Our anonymous donor that gave in the fall uh, came back with another um, half a million plus uh, gift and the gift was given to students who had not received any funding <coughs> since the fall so there was that initial round and then students had received some funding here and there um, but on the six month anniversary they came back to me and said we want to do it again they're very quiet about it it's just the, the best kind um, so over the course of the year, we've been able to fund um, almost $1.8 million in um, funding for Hurricane Harvey relief, and it was 2,061 students and 560 employees. 1.8 uh, from the foundation, does that include the money that the city gave us also? Yes, sir. There okay. was money from the city of Houston, there was money from PACC, um, Hearthstone, the anonymous donor, um, we, and we have monies that came in. Um, from community colleges all across the country, local donors, and then what uh, Lone Star College and the Chancellor has had put together to help the employees. When we talked, I, I just, I don't know any other college that put up $1.8 million to help, uh, help students. Most of it's from the anonymous donor, but we put up quite a bit ourselves, and the, the community did, so. so. Thank you. Yeah. Great job, Good thank report. you. Thank you. Kim, now you have a chance to tell me about House Bill 2223. Okay. Hello, trustees. Hello there. Hello. Chairman Hello. 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 Chancellor Hill. Start the clock. All right. Developmental education update. Wendy Wilson, who is the executive director of developmental ed and curriculum management, helps with this. This is her wheelhouse. So we're gonna talk about national trends in developmental education first. So developmental education refers to those students who come to us testing below college ready in reading, writing, and mathematics. It used to be called remedial, remedial education. We don't call it that anymore. We think of it more as developmentally moving students along the continuum. Um, this study right here kicked off uh, quite a stir nationally. Um, this was a, um, one of several studies done by Bailey, Thomas Bailey and other researchers. And what it showed, they looked at 141,000 math students and found that if those students have to begin their college work three levels below college ready, so if they have to slog their way through three or more developmental math courses, um, they are only 17% likely to graduate or complete as they start three levels below in reading, they are only 29% likely to graduate. So developmental students start out with a, a long way to go before they can even get to their college courses. And this, um, this seems to be a barrier for them. Uh, just under one third of students referred to developmental courses never actually even registered for courses, which caused Bailey and other researchers to conclude that just being just being put in developmental education was a barrier to onboarding right away. They didn't even start. Um, the other issue is they found that students who tested just below college readiness, we call them bubble students, they're on the bubble of being college ready. If you put those students straight into credit level courses, they tend to do just as well as the students who tested into credit level courses. So these studies uh, caused a huge shift in developmental education. 
So if you take 100 students and you assume that we had a 75% pass rate in all developmental courses, then 56 students would go to the second level and 42 students would, would end up in, in credit courses or would complete credit courses. So you're talking about 42 students out of 100 students. Um, if you're assuming 75% pass rate at all levels, and that would be a pretty good pass rate. That would be a very good success rate. At Lone Star, we have a 24% success rate in math. Students who start at the, the lowest level of developmental ed and continue all the way through, 57% in reading, 53% in writing. So Powellsville, 22-23. Uh, that, that caused a big stir last year. It passed June 15, 2017, and the coordinating board is now requiring that by this fall, fall 2018, 25% of students in our developmental courses must be put in credit level courses with co-requisite remediation support. 50% by fall 19 and 75% in fall 2020. So 75% of our students who test into developmental education in fall 2020 must be put into credit courses with an additional support course. So development, what is a developmental prerequisite? So it's a class that the students take at the same time that they take credit level. So for example, if you test into developmental English, you would take English 1301 with a 0119 or 0219 support course in the same semester at the same time. The purpose is to help you get through your English course. It's the same thing with math. Not all students who test into developmental ed are required to take this. Uh, students who have a TSI exemption or waiver, veterans for example, are not required to register for developmental courses. Um, students who score below the floor of developmental education we're handling those students through uh, continuing education. Students without a college map in their program, for example, a level two certificate, do not have to register for co-requisite courses. What's important to understand is that these students have to take a developmental course at, in the same semester, generally at the same time that they take the credit level course. I mean, a developmental course could come before, but it's in the same semester that they're taking the credit level course. So I'm going to show you numbers in a minute. Just remember, 25 by this fall, 50 next fall, 75% the following fall. Okay, so here are our fall 2017 numbers. Uh, we had 4,279 students taking developmental English last fall. We had 2,386 students taking EFAL. Now, you've heard from Rebecca Royer, spoke a couple of months ago, and she's right about one thing. ESOL students are really not developmental students. We sort of have a problem with this mandate from the state because um, many of our ESOL students have degrees in their home countries. They're not developmental students. They simply have to acquire English skills, but they're very different from developmental students. The state has decreed that they are going to be counted in our developmental numbers for the purposes of this 25, 50, and 75 percent. So we're working on that. Math is by far our largest developmental population, 10,579 students last fall. So the grand total, 17,244. The total eligible for co-requisite is 7,176. So here, uh, Lone Star has said, okay, 25% is what is mandated by the state, but if we set our target at 35%, then we definitely won't fall below our numbers for the state. So we've set a 35% target for ourselves. That means in English, we have to create courses for students for fall for 1,300 students. That's a lot. We have been working very hard on this all year, and 1,200 students from that. I want to take a minute to congratulate Wendy Wilson, who came on sometime last year, year and a half ago. I don't remember when exactly, but 
she has worked wonders. She has gotten six colleges to agree on how we are going to do this for English mm -hmm. and math. That in itself is a miracle, and she deserves a lot of credit for that. Mm -hmm. She's a, a wonderful person to work with. All right, so math. We have four math classes that we are building co-recs for. Um, I did not know all the numbers. I'm an English person. I know English really well, so I had to put a cheat sheet on the presentation just so that I knew what these math courses were. So we've got um, college algebra is a 48-hour course, and we're adding a 48-hour co-rec to it. So students will be in six hours of math a week. Um, business math, same thing, 48 to 48. Uh, math for liberal arts, we're going to co-rec that with a 32-hour course, so they will have um, four hours. Um, We've got two hours a week, um, and no, four hours a week, and statistics, same thing. And so um, we have different co-requisites for the different gateway courses, the different gateway math. For English, it's very interesting what we decided to do for English. At least it's interesting for me. I don't know how you're going to feel about it. Um, 0119 is once a week. And it's for students who test below college ready in either reading or writing, once a week. 0219 for students who tested below college ready in both reading and writing. And it's twice a week. You can see how we worked that out. So the most common and most well-known model for co-requisite remediation courses is the OUT model designed by Community College of Baltimore County. And they are an Achieving the Dream, Dream School. They presented this often at Achieving the Dream. And years and years and years ago, Kathy Cecil Sanchez went to an Achieving the Dream conference and brought this model back to Palm Ball. And we implemented it. It's been at least eight years, I think. And the way it works is you have one, you build an English 1301 that is capped at 25 students. 15 of the students in the course are regular 1301 students. They either came up through developmental ed or they tested directly into English 1301. And 10 of those students are actually developmental students. So you're mainstreaming your developmental students into 1301 with your regular 1301 students. Those 10 students are co-enrolled in English 0119 or 0219. They generally meet with the same professor directly after class for an additional 50 minutes of workshop time and one-on-one -on -one help with their professor. And so that way they have the same professor, the professor is working with them on the assignment for the 1301 class. And we've done this for a number of years and it works very well. The out model can utilize the same instructors for both the 1301 or the co-requisite class, or you can use, you can team teach. You can have a developmental professor teaching the co-requisite developmental course and a credit instructor teaching the 1301. There are some alternative models. Um, English 1301 paired with 0119 for 30 minutes per day. The students are not mainstreamed. It's a cohort model. Uh, for the students, it feels like a 64 hour English 1301. Uh, you can build 0119 and 0219 courses that are standalone, taught by different instructors. The students simply choose an English 1301, and then they choose a prerequisite course. And this is, we're working on approving the third one. Um, and we're going to work on this, we're going to do this with ESOL students, and I'm very excited about it. For students who test, who need help in reading, you can pair a developmental course with history, government, psychology, sociology, something really cool and interesting, and the developmental um, professor works with them on their reading assignment in those, uh, the reading intensive course. You've got some really cross-disciplinary work going on there, you get faculty working together, Math prerequisite configurations and fields. I mean, you have all those options with math as well. And this is a screenshot straight from my dissertation. Um, I interviewed 16 prerequisite students for my dissertation research. And you can see that they were quite varied. Uh, six different races or ethnicities were selected. Um, I had a good mix of males and females. The age range was 18 to 36. Um, you can see that, um, you know, about half of them worked, half of them did not. Um, about half were first generation and the other half were not. Um, and it was, a, it was really interesting talking with them. I did interviews with all of them. 
So the path to co-requisite English took me by surprise. When I started my research, I did not realize how many ways were, were into it. So what we found out, we had originally built the courses for students who tested just below college ready, just below, you know, they were above it. What we found out, though, is that students who tested into the lowest levels of developmental ed were being referred into these co-requisite courses by professors who taught them the level one reading and level one writing. They said, you've got this. You can do this. You should skip English 0309 and go into 1301 with support. You're going to do great. And what was interesting was for the students who were referred into these courses, they said, several of them said, I didn't believe in myself. I didn't know I was good at this until my professor told me I was good at this and that I should skip English 0309. It was very interesting. The connection with their professor, the feedback from the professor, the, the faith that their professor had in them to do really well in a credit level course, even though the test told them that they weren't ready for that, it meant all the difference in the world. Six of them uh, were, were referred by, um, by their advisors and they were very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, two of them argued their way into the co-rec class. Um, and what was interesting is one of those was Sarah Fina. She was a, um, she had gotten into A&M, she just graduated from high school, gotten into A&M, went to A&M, went to an orientation. She didn't really like what she heard, decided to go to Lone Star. She uh, wasn't as interested in the program they were offering her. She um, had been an AP student in high school, had a lot of confidence about her ability, in her ability. She had retaken the TSIA three times, did not test in the college ready, went to the advisor, found out about co-requisites, and said, I'm taking this, and you're not going to stop me. The advisor said, okay. She made an A. She then got into honors. She made an A in her honors English 1302. She has since graduated. And she is now, I believe, at the University of Houston. Um, Opal, non-traditional student, three children. She was referred into co-requisite mediation by her um, English 0304, 0306 faculty members. She's one of the ones who said, she when, when my professor said she believed in me, I realized I needed to as well. And she went into co-rec and did very, very well. Tony took me by surprise. Tony was one of the first students I interviewed. I didn't, uh, hadn't written my IRB for Tony. Tony had tested into English 1301, failed it, and decided to take English 1301 with a co-rec, even though he didn't need to, because he knew he, or he believed he needed the extra help. And he said it made all the difference in the world in his success. And so I hear this line a lot in pathways that students don't do optional. Actually, the first two students I interviewed for my study both did optional. They were both registered for co-requisite classes even though they didn't need to. They had tested into English 1301, but they felt that they needed extra help. And Pui, I interviewed actually three or four, um, three uh, students who had immigrated from Vietnam and were struggling with English acquisition. And they were doing very well in English in the co-requisite classes and were getting that extra help. And so my, my pool was very diverse. The outcomes for the students in my study, all of them passed English 1301 or 0119. 11 of them, 11 of the 16, in, enrolled in and passed 1302. Of those 11, three have graduated and several are still enrolled. Several indicated transfer plans in their interviews, so I'm pretty confident that they transferred. Of the five students who have not passed English 1302, two are still enrolled off and on, and three of the five have disappeared. So I think that, um, I know that my 16 students probably aren't indicative of national trends necessarily, but they were pretty successful. Um, and these are students who would have possibly languished in developmental ed for, for several semesters. So it cannot be emphasized how much money prerequisites save them. They don't have to take it. You know, they're only taking a one or two credit class as opposed to several classes over several semesters. Okay, and this is my last slide. This has nothing to do with prerequisite mediation, but I wanted to ask, does anybody know what this refers to? Anybody in the room at all? <laughs> what? That's right. What did he say? Award. What yeah. did he say? Yeah, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is the title of the fourth book in Douglas Adams' three book or four book trilogy, Five. Douglas Five. Adams can't count, 
<laughs> and what it is, it's the dolphins saying goodbye and thanking human beings for all the fish they have eaten. And so, like the dolphins, I would like to thank you for four years of being faculty senate president. I came on as faculty senate president when several of you were just elected board yeah. members. So I yeah. feel like we kind of made this journey together. Yeah. But you made me feel very welcome. I have learned a lot. I appreciate your mentorship. And uh, it has been a blast. I do have a question, though. You mentioned Baltimore County Community mm -hmm. College. And they had a uh, correct model. You know, correct model. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any data on how successful? Very. How success very. That's why the COREC model has spread. And in fact, with House Bill 2223, COREC's are mandated in the state now. So we're, um, we, we have to put students in COREC. And the OUT model designed by Baltimore County is considered the sort of the um, flagship model. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the foundation model. So it's, they, so students that, do very well. So our graduation rate should be. Yeah. Increase substantially as a result of this and data yes. plays out here. We're hoping so. What we're yeah. hoping is that developmental students won't stop out, drop out. They right. will be propelled forward. That, combined with our pathways work and all that, should should help, should increase our completion rate, our success rate. Excellent. Excellent. Alicia, Thank you. Alicia, did you, you worked in Baltimore County, right? Tim, and the meaning of life is 42. Yes. <laughs> okay, board members, you've heard reports from the, from the administration. <laughs> now it's time for you to tell us about schools that you've visited over the last month, other things that you have done that's worthy of being mentioned. mentioned. And I'll start with Ms. Good. Thank you. I had the pleasure of attending the 15th International Ed Conference um, on April 20th here um, at the system office. It was very informative. It was also very exciting to see everything that we are doing as a system to foster um, international education as a two-way opportunity, both getting students out into the world and bringing the world to the students. So I encourage you to attend next year. Okay, I will. Thank you. Miriam, I, I'm going to go last. Oh. Okay, Ken. I'm fine. Go ahead. Uh, I have two very brief and worthless announcements. Brief and worthless. That's an option. This is going to be very short. Oh, no no problem. Right. No worry. Go ahead. All right. You have the floor. Uh, there is in Homer's Odyssey a mean beast with one eye called Cyclops. Yeah. This eye does not work. I'm going to go in in a week and try to have it fixed to see if I can get it up and running. In the meantime, I shall be addressed here tonight not as trustee Trowbridge, but as, as trustee Cyclops. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. I, I'm almost done. Oh, I thought you were through. No, okay, go I'm ahead. <laughs> My second worthless announcement is I have decided to move to California. I have put my house up for sale. I intend to become a California flower child. <laughs> That's it. Somebody's clapping. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. Uh, I have a few things I want to want to mention. The list is kind of medium long. Uh, on April nineteenth, I had the opportunity to attend the Rising Star Banquet that was held at the Hyde Regency North. And I was invited by a North Harris student. I found it real interesting. 
and it's stuff that I like anyway, is recognizing, I think, students that have, that have gone over and beyond and that were nominated by their peers. Uh, on April the 27th, I attended the National Association of Collegiate Scholars at Montgomery, and I was the guest speaker you know, at that particular event. I had never heard of this organization, but I was really, really enthused at the number of students that were inducted that night that had a perfect grade point average. And one of them was a student that had a sight disability, <laughs> you know, which shows that all of our students can achieve and we make accommodations for those that have situations that may be different from others. Um, I had, a, along with Quentin and several other folks, I had a chance to attend a follow-up meeting with the Mayor's Committee on Complete Communities. And what they were basically looking for were things that Lone Star can do to help underprivileged communities become self-sufficient, as, as I put it. Uh, Dr. had already mentioned the science and innovation uh, activity, and that was a, a very well-organized and, and a very uh, worthwhile meeting that I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed attending. Uh, I also went to Victory Center on April the 17th for their open house and had a chance to see folks from the community coming in and getting an eyeful of stuff that they can get, you know, from Lone Star right in the community. The last thing I want to mention is going to happen tomorrow, and I mention this primarily to board members, but it impacts others also. But the, the ACCT, and you may know this already, is having a webinar tomorrow at 2 p.m. And the webinar deals with the reauthor reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. And it's, it's called PROSPER. And the purpose of the, re of, the, of the webinar is to make sure everyone is up to speed on what, what has been proposed under PROSPER. And all you have to do is register for the webinar, and then they'll make sure that you have, a, have access to that particular data. So I encourage as many of you that can, listen to that webinar and provide input to your elected officials on stuff that you agree or disagree with, but it's your opportunity to be heard. Oh, I was wondering what that was, okay. Thirdly, and lastly, I know this is long, I am attending a CC ATT, which stands for Community College Association of Texas Trustees. I will be attending a session on January the 1st and the 2nd. And June, June 1st, what did I say, January? Good God Almighty. Okay. <laughs> June 1st and 2nd, thank you, that's a long time to wait. And our, during this meeting, there's going to be an election uh, of our offices that are open. And the offices that are open is our chair-elect, secretary, and four at-large positions. And I have been asked to become a candidate for one of the at-large positions, and I, uh, I gladly accepted the opportunity. So I'll try to bring the uh, victory home. There are six folks that have applied for the four positions, and I I feel pretty confident that I get one of them. I appreciate your support in that. And with that, that's all I have in that particular category. Any, anybody else have anything else? If not, Helen, do we have any citizens wishing to speak to us tonight? Three, okay. How are y'all? Hi, Dave. Hi, how you doing, Dave? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, one of you as well. <laughs> now, I was just uh, just wanted some clarification on some of the free speech zones on campus. Uh, I know in the policy manual it says that they are designated areas on each facility, but there seems not to be a way to find out where exactly they are in any policy that I've been able to find. Okay. So I was just 
That would be a clarification. Okay. And yeah. Just go ahead. Okay. The rules on what we're allowed to do and not do within the plan. Oh yeah. Well yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If we can just reiterate those. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you might not know is what he was saying basically. When citizens have the opportunity to to comment to the board, sure. it's not an agenda item, and all of the items that we discuss have to be posted, you know, before the meeting. And one of the things that we will will tell you is that your question, you know, is you heard it, and we're going to ask the chancellor and his staff to to make sure that that's known uh, to the uh, to the students at large. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, so, so we can't we, can, we cannot <clears throat> discuss it tonight. Right. Okay. But it will be uh, addressed appropriately. So okay. if you'll make sure that uh, Helen Clarity has your name and telephone Perfect. number, we'll get back with you immediately over Perfect. this. Okay. Because okay. we're clear about this. Yeah, I just so. want to be clear on each campus where right. they are and designated. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank okay. you. And we appreciate the way, you know, that, Thank that you. you had a question, you came to us, and that's the way it should be. So I appreciate, appreciate it. You. Thank you. Thank we'll, you. Get, we'll get back to you right. immediately. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I am John Bergdorf, representing the American Federation of Teachers. <clears throat> At the April Board of Trustees meeting, Faculty Senate President Dr. Anthony Carrera from Kingwood finished his speech to the board by affirming his support for taxes. Board member Dr. Kyle Scott followed up by asking him, and all of us really, what he believed was the correct balance between taxes and tuition in funding Lone Star College. This is a difficult philosophical question that has a very real impact on Lone Star students and district citizens. As everyone here to know, tonight knows, the three main pillars of community college funding in Texas are state allocations, local taxes, and student tuition. The state expects Texas public colleges and universities to increase the number of degrees granted by 1.7% per year to reach a goal of 550,000 de college degrees in 2030. However, every session, the legislature cuts the percentage of higher education costs the state will cover. Unless there are dramatic changes in state leadership, that trend is going to continue. Therefore, unfortunately, the ever-increasing costs of educating more of our fellow Texans fall at the feet of our local taxpayers and our students to ever higher degrees. Dr. Carrera confessed that he did not know what the proper balance was between local taxes and tuition. We in the AFT don't know the answer to that question either. However, we have some thoughts to consider regarding one of those sources. According to the Texas Association of Community Colleges, Lone Star College's property tax rate of 10.72 cents per $100 of valuation places us 44th among the 50 reporting community college systems. For years, we have taken our low tax rate as something to boast about, and we have systematically lowered that tax rate many times. Fiscal responsibility is obviously a great virtue, but over the years, that frugalness has hurt us. For example, before Dr. Head became chancellor, Lone Star had fallen to second from the bottom among Texas community colleges on percentage of classes covered by full-time faculty. Fixing that one problem is very, very expensive, and we're grateful that that process is underway. But now, facing the enormous physical damage from Hurricane Harvey and the drop in enrollment that has followed, we are faced with the prospect of cutting class sections for fall, even while we need to grow. Across the state, the average tax rate is about 18.06 cents per $100 valuation. This is approximately what our neighbors at San Jacinto College levy. If Lone Star charged the state average tax rate, our property tax revenues would increase by, by over $123 million. What would the impact on a typical taxpayer be? For a house valued at $200,000, property taxes would increase by just over $12 per month. In terms my freshman students could relate to better, that's three grande lattes per month at Starbucks. Is that too much to ask? What if we only raise the tax rate to the rollback rate? 
This is the rate above which citizens could petition for a tax rollback election. According to the Lone Star College website, that rate would be 11.37 cents for a $100 valuation fee. That increase would cost the homeowner described previously only about a dollar extra per month and would bring the college an extra $11 million per year. This rate would still put us substantially below the rates levied by, by our friends in the Dallas, Alamo, Tarrant County, and El Paso community college systems. We live in a time when, for some political demographics, the reaction to any hint of a tax increase is a knee-jerk no. Yet, most of the citizens of our district recognize the incredible value Lone Star College brings to their families and their communities. We believe that they can be convinced that it would be worth a dollar a month, or maybe even a latte, or two, or three. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. I guess he's, he's not here. Okay. Okay. Th thank you, Helen. Let's move to the uh, to the con consent agenda. We have uh, we've heard item number two. Item eleven. And item 19 will be held, uh, heard separately. Board members, are there any other consent items that you would like to have heard separately? If not, I would like to have a motion to adopt items 1, 3 through 10, 12 through 18, and 12 through 18. And 20 and 21. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded that we adopt those items. All those in, any, all those in favor of by the usual sign? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passed. Aye. Item 11. Jennifer, are you? Oh. I asked Jennifer to explain number 11 and number 19 I, I wanted to be very clear and upfront about what we're what we're asking for in both cases so. yes so on number 11 what happened there is when the spring isd lease was initially entered into it was for thirty thousand dollars which is below the hundred thousand dollar threshold of what needs to come to the board so initially that lease was not brought to the board there came a point this past february where it was realized that it needed to be renewed and quite frankly it should have been brought to the board at that point in time because cumulative the lease exceeded a hundred thousand um, dollars the expiration date of end of February this was realized early February when it was already past the board date so and it, I did sign an administrative approval to renew that lease so we are bringing this item today requesting ratification and recognizing that simply being late on getting this lease renewed is really not best practices. So the this is the Truck Driving Institute, and what's the total amount of money? Uh, there is in the sheet here, so the total, we are at, um, it's been about 60000 a year. So the renewal, so the total here is 240000 So Well, you missed the 60000 that we would we should have come back for a 60,000 ratification because we went over the 100,000 mark, so. Okay. So you've heard the explanation. Can I have a motion on item number 11 and a second? So moved. Second. It's been moved and properly second that we adopt item 11. Comments, questions? Just one comment, I really appreciate the us recognizing the error, bringing the error forward, and I like the transparency, and even though the error was made, so thank you for bringing it back rather than cover, well, rather than not bringing it back. I, I almost have a word that we don't want on the record. Okay, so any other comments? All those in favor, vote by the usual sign. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. So number 19 uh, deals with Kingwood, and um, our goal is to open up Kingwood in January of 19, fully open January of 19. 
and our total cost so far, the damages from the hurricane are about $40 million. But the longer we go with Kingwood not fully open, it's really beginning to hit us in the pocketbook. So uh, what we're asking for is some approval to move forward that's out of the norm for what we would do so that we can expedite Kingwood and, and get it open in January. So if you'll explain exactly what's going on there. Yes, this is to help us meet opening January 2019. So our typical process, I mean, so for Kingwood, there is a lot of, a lot, $19 million worth of specialty equipment, lab equipment, furniture, IT equipment that we need to get purchased to reopen January of 19. Typically, our process for doing purchases is we go out for bid on those items and we receive those bids in, um, an evaluation is done of quality and cost, and then what we bring to the board for approval for those items over 100000 is a request to authorize us to negotiate and execute a contract with a particular vendor to purchase that item. So it goes by item. This does add about two months to the entire process. So what we are doing here is we are putting together the list of everything that needs to be purchased. We have not yet gone out and gotten all of these bids, but what we are doing is asking here for authorization to spend up to $19 million total and to give the chancellor authority to execute individual contracts that will be above 100000 but not above a million. That way, as we get bids in, we can just immediately go and execute that contract and complete the purchase. So this is similar to somewhat to the authority we had before when for emergency purchases, but everything would still come, well, if it's over a million, it would have to come back here, period. If it's uh, over a hundred, in between that up to a million, we would move ahead with it. We would still notify you like we would that we've done this. Then we would come back at the next board meeting and ratify. So the problem that we have right now, or the challenge is we're not meeting in July. So some of the options, that that's under the best case scenario, is that we would have to have a couple of special meetings to approve our expenditures if we don't do something. I don't think, the way things are going, that if we don't have this authority to move ahead, that we're going to be able to get everything um, ready for Kingwood by January. We have to wait for the board meeting. So that's what we're asking for. This is a... a one time, this is not a permanent um, policy change. This is for Kingwood only for this particular situation. So, so I want to make sure I understand. Are you asking for authority to go outside our usual procurement process to, for the purpose of purchasing these items for Kingwood up to $19 million? That's a lot. We are not changing the procurement process. We're still going to, it's still going to be the competitive processes of getting bids. What we are changing is sort of the order of when we come to the board. Typically, we receive the bids, and then we come to the board for approval with a specific bid and vendor to purchase the equipment from. Um, so we, typically, we come at the end of a competitive procurement process. We are still doing a competitive procurement process. I absolutely want to make sure because that's how I get FEMA reimbursement, hopefully. Um, but really, now we're just coming to the board on the front end instead. That way, once those competitive bids are in and we see where the best value bid is, instead of at that point coming to the board, we already have approval to then just take the contract to the chancellor and complete the purchase. Let's do this. Let's do this first, though. We're evaluating a Robert Rules of Order. Let's get a motion, you know, on that particular item, and then second, then we'll come back with questions and comments. Can we have a motion to adopt? Uh, second. Second. We move moving probably second that we adopt the item 19. Uh, ready for questions or comments? So, Linda, you, did you finish with yeah, your Okay, thank so you. So, this $19 million is not just one. This is going to be a number of. Correct. Bid procurement process. Oh, yes. Yes. And not to exceed them. that maximum. Yeah, and, and um, the bid tabs that are typically included when we bring the individual items to the board for approval, we can definitely still provide all of this to the board for information to show that we have followed the same processes that we would normally. 
So give them some examples of what we're talking about here. Like um, I mean, really, the one of the big ones is going to be furniture. I mean, we're going to have, hopefully, at the June board, you're going to see a request to approve the construction. And that's going to be, obviously, very important that we have the construction firm come in and rebuild everything. But then you're going to have empty rooms. We're going to need desks. We're going to need tables and chairs for the classrooms. Um, it's a lot of, of purchases. And I, like I said, we don't believe any single purchase exceeds a million dollars. So you are talking about a lot of, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollar purchases. We're basically refurbishing six buildings over there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a like a startup of another. Are, are you refurnishing, refurnishing the second and third floor buildings? No, just the bottom floor. Yeah. Um, but then IT equipment as well. A lot, you know, a lot of the computers um, that need to be replaced. Are, are if I remember, we already in the plan, in the budget for recycling. I'm sorry, say that again. I said, are any any of that IT equipment is that any of that in already in the budget for recycle? I mean, there is the, whatever that typical budget is, but this is to replace all the computers that were lost. Yeah. But weren't some of them of the to be replaced anyway in this cycle? Oh. Yeah. Link, link yeah. out. So when we, went, when we reviewed all the IT equipment that's in there, there are some that were phased out of the IT department. So that was like the IT portion of those are still out there. We also put a couple of uh, pilot uh, in the process of doing that as well. So we are doing that as well. Okay. Thank you. Who, who's on the bid or selection list? What's the team? Who's that team that make the selection on the on the bids or whatever? It's going to be a lot of them. We're making a lot of but individual who are the, purchases. You and who else will be making that decision? So it's um, I don't sit on. I'm not going to be sitting on any of these selection committees, um, and it's going to be depending on what specifically is being purchased. So, like I said, for each one of these items, I can will definitely come back with a full report okay. on all of the documentation that you would normally see in an in, uh, in agenda item. So we would not be coming back to the board for ratification. We would move ahead. The only thing we'd be coming back to the board or coming to the board with is a million dollars or more. Yes. All those individual items, we want to move ahead so that we can get the college reopened. Yeah. yeah. So the bid process is going to be the same. We're yes. still going to be getting the emails about blacklist. Or, right, so yeah. we're not going to comment. Okay. Now, we've proposed something similar um, in terms of the spending that coming back for the reauthorization that I didn't support at the time, but this seems to make sense in that it's a one-time authorization and not an indefinite yeah. authorization. Yeah. The funds are not fungible. They have to remain within Kingwood. Yeah. And this $19 million escalates almost exponentially if we go past the January deadline because we start hemorrhaging students at that point. And which means our revenue stream gets hit. And not only that, we have a negative impact on the students. Students who would have matriculated won't. And students who we have a tough time retaining drop out. I think that's what the key, key point, I think you mentioned that we want to open in November, in uh, January, January of 2019. 2019. Huh? January of 19. That's, that's what I, well, <laughs> that's what yeah. I said. <laughs> January 2019. You said it. Did I, I say it that time? Yeah, you, you okay, picked it up right. the first okay. time. I got it the first time. And a delay because of the process could cause the building not to be ready in time. So what that would result in had us having to wait until the next following semester. Right. To open. It's kind of what Kyle said. Okay. We're potentially talking about several million dollars lost revenue here. Yeah. That's what's been happening with the declines in Kingwood. But that assumes that we don't otherwise approve things in time. Did I hear you say something about the other option is some special board meeting? Yes, yes, yes. So that's the, the alternative to granting this $19 million of authority. Any other comments, questions? If not, 
Those in favor, vote by the usual sign. Aye. 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 Oppo opposition? Opposed. Opposed. Okay. Two, op two opposed. And five, six, five. Can I give you one? One, two, three, four, five, two. Motion, motion passed. Okay. Jennifer, I think you're still on with the financial report. Financial report. Okay, so in our financial report, what you have presented in your book are the financial statements for the month ending March 31st, 2018. Uh, and first, you'll see in the first chart, our revenues, which is really uh, what it's continued to be since the spring is 79.4% of revenues, which you can see is below um, last year. Um, it's sort of in line with prior years, and this is keeping in mind, right, that we did see the drop in spring enrollment. In page two, you see the actual expenditures as a percent of budget. That is also continuing to trend below prior years at 51.2% at this point in the year. Page three of the financial report really is good news at this point, um, although I don't like to rest on it quite yet. Our forecast currently has us ending the year at 16.4%, so that is definitely very positive. Our goal was to end at 16%, um, but this month in particular, we are closing April's books right now. We're going to do a very thorough scrub to make sure that we are confident that we are going to end at at least the 16% was the goal set in the budget. Um, from there, I really want to jump to some of the Harvey expenditures. Page 5 is the report for Fund 35. That's where you can see so far what we have actually spent is $13 million. Um, and 10 of that has been at Kingwood. So Fund 35 is our hurricane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harvey Fund. And then on page six is the balance sheet for the Hurricane Harvey Fund. Uh, the main point I want to make here is we have spent $13 million. We received a little over $10 million so far in insurance proceeds. So you can see that cash and cash equivalents is negative $2 million. Accounting-wise, this is allowed in a, fund, in a Fund 35 fund. What this does effectively mean, just so we are aware, is that we are effectively borrowing from ourselves out of the cash reserve. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons we want to continue to maintain a strong cash reserve. And then at the end of the day, we do have to make sure, I mean, it can be some time still, but at the end of the day, this fund, we will have to balance out to zero. So that's where, as you approve the board agenda items for Harvey-related costs, the fiscal impact statement says that first, this fund gets paid for by insurance proceeds, second, by FEMA reimbursement, and then third, once we see what falls out from there is where we will ultimately have to reimburse this fund either from the bond funds for capital items that we can fund through the bond authorization and then anything remaining would have to come from the reserve right, that 16 percent reserve so i did want to note that what's the latest on on fema yeah that's where i'm pulling oh, oh, up next oh. sorry i can't go ahead so on fema we continue to do our part in giving them the loads of paperwork that they require, which means we have submitted now project worksheets for $36.2 million, um, which is in various stages of being reviewed. So they review them, they come back and ask questions, we have to then revise some of the paperwork that's been submitted. So we have $36.2 million worth of project worksheets under review by FEMA, so that is at um, so right now right the 39 million of estimated costs that I reported last month a lot of this is still built on estimates so that number is going to continue to sort of fluctuate as we refine that number so right now it's actually come down a bit to 37 million um, so we're showing 37 million dollars worth of estimated costs total and 36 million 
is what has been submitted documentation to FEMA so far. So we submitted 97% of our estimated costs. Now what happens is as we actually realize those costs, right, a lot of this is still estimates. We just talked about this 19 million that we still have to go out and get bids for. So a lot of this is still estimates. 13 million is the amount that we've actually spent. So uh, we have submitted 97% of what the estimated total cost is that's eligible for FEMA reimbursement. Um, and so we're continuing to do our part and be responsive as FEMA does the reviews and asks questions. And from there, we wait. In general, what kind of questions do they ask? It's usually very detailed questions. They're reviewing invoices um, to make sure that everything included in invoices are eligible for reimbursement. And then we have to submit um, projects so could we have to submit the details of what we're building back because if we uh, I mean if we build back exact like for like then that's generally easier but if we make modifications which in some instances it makes sense for us to do so for example we already know we want to move the server room from the first floor to the second floor um, so things like that make a lot of sense but now there are things where we're not building back precisely as it was so we have to talk through those differences with FEMA. Mm -hmm. um, and just so as they get the documentation, it's we have a team of people working through this, including consultants helping us do this. And if I remember what the chancellor said, we're doing some refurbishing to the building that we would have been coming up soon anyway. Well, we have the healthcare building being up. Yeah, we didn't have too much new, schedule. But that's it. Uh, I, I'm not sure what I said, but what I what I would have said was we're basically remodeling the parts of Kingwood that were flooded. So when it's through, they're going to have a nice, I mean, it's like remodeling it. I mean, same thing as remodeling your house after a flood. So that's what's happening right there. But we didn't have anything outside of the, we didn't have any buildings scheduled for, or one building scheduled for. I think we do did have uh, that we're going to utilize is in phase three of the bond. So since we're building a new healthcare, healthcare building as okay. phase two of the bond, phase three did have some renovation funds to come back and redo the spaces that was going to move to the new building. Well, some of those spaces are what is flooded. So mm -hmm. if we're building it back now, we don't necessarily we don't need to then go renovate them in phase three of the bond. Okay. So there is some capacity there. You want to hit assessed value while you're here, the preliminary? So assessed value, uh, right. So for Montgomery County Appraisal District, the certified estimate that re we received from them is 9%, which is 25% uh, of our total taxable value is Montgomery County. And then Harris County, which I'm very happy about because they had previously been telling us to expect flat, they came back at 3%. So right now, we're looking at a weighted average estimated growth in assessed value next fiscal year of something around 4%. And that's much better than what we had anticipated in the budget, much better. I mean, we'd been prepared for zero at, in uh, Harris County because that's what we were told. So that came in on Monday, and that makes a big difference in the way we are taking a look at our budget for next year. So we're going to be in good shape, uh, I nope. think. People have a chance to to appeal. How much does the tax base increase as a result of this appeal? Do you and you may not know. I was just wondering. I don't know off the top of my head, but usually when we get the estimate from the appraisal district, it's um, it's what we call the estimated value with hear estimated hearing loss. So usually, what we're utilizing is allowing some factor for estimated losses uh, due to those protests. Yeah, and I can get you the more well, specific you don't have, of how don't, much we typically Don't spend any time doing, doing that unless it's yet. But the, the weighted average 4% is including some consideration already for that, okay. for that estimated yeah. loss. That's, that's the only point I wanted to make, yeah. but that's probably going to be next year. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we do that up front. Okay. All right. Any additional 
you don't have any additional data on this from the ground up, what we're going to report, right? Okay, board members, any future suggested agenda items? I think I asked Dr. Hitt this a couple of months ago. Have, when was the last time we've done like an energy conservation for the site? Jennifer, uh, energy conservation, when's the last time we did, when did we do the contract? A year ago for right about the time you arrived? Energy conservation and reviewed our energy cost. That was his question. But probably, but Ken, are you asking for that to be an agenda item? I, I just I want to know when we've done. It. We'll get you a report on yeah. that. We have. We'll put it in the next time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If there are no other. No. I, I oh yeah, I'm sorry. Sir, um, do we have any students left? Any students? Yeah. Would, sure. Can I ask this question too? What yeah. What do you guys think of the stadium? Give us your honest opinion. For those of you who stayed awake. Yes. <laughs> if nobody staying, I'll call on someone. <laughs> no, let us go home. No, let's yeah, let us go home. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to say, I just want to say thank you for spending time with us. Um, we welcome you to come back. We do this once a month, except um, no. it's the end July. of the month. July. 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 Yeah. So, hopefully, you guys liked it. Thank you. Meeting's over. It does.